to start his presentation for today. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm surprised that you remember everything that what I did. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I just want to thank Dr. Pahari with one statement that she was one of our seniors and mentors while we were doing masters in IIT Delhi. And since then, I mean, having her is a privilege in my life. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks to the Amity University and the faculties. And I know a few students who are participants. I welcome you all. Today, is, my talk will be about my current work. I'm not showing you my earlier work, but most recent work, what we are trying to do. I work with a clinician surgeon in Hopkins on regenerating, regenerating uh, neuronary conduit. It's related to bladder, you would see. My presentation is going to be very simple because I keep it simple. I don't want to complicate it. Uh, there's no point if you don't understand the presentation. It's wastage of time for everyone. So please feel free to ask me any questions during the presentation. And we will be going through that. Hopefully you learn something with this presentation. Let's see where it is here. So I just said to you that I'm going to talk to you about regenerative engineering in urology. And why urology? Because my primary department is urology and the secondary appointment is with chemical and biomolecular engineering where I teach chemical engineering courses, including polymer design and bioconjugation. So my training in polymers is getting applied in biomedical engineering and uh, I have been in biomedical engineering for quite a while. So it's, it's the area where I work. So I would say that Whenever you try to regenerate a tissue, you have to come up with approaches and it should be step by step. Often we jump ahead and do things. That is also great. There's nothing wrong about it. But to solve a complex problem, we need to approach it very systematically. This is my philosophy. We can do engineering, we can engineer things, but we, know, we need to know science behind it. We have to be very clear with the fundamental of science. Otherwise, you will see, uh, you can publish papers, you can get grants, but you won't solve a problem because there is always something attached to it. A few of you might know the urological system in our body it starts with kidney and through ureter, the urine goes to bladder and from the bladder, urethra, urethra is the conduit or a tube which brings the urine out of your body. Now, if you think about this, urological system and related diseases, they are in 2000, actually in 2000, uh, they did a survey and they found that it cost almost $11 billion with medical related surgeries and treatment with these systems. One of those problems, one of the challenges that people have, especially in the older age and people who smoke is bladder cancer. So people who smoke, they should always be worried that later in their life, around 60 and more, they are going to have bladder cancer. More or less it is right, especially for men. So people who smoke, I would urge you to not smoke. It's really bad. Now, every year, around 80,000 people are getting diagnosed with bladder cancer and 13,000 people are dying. Not everybody is dying who has bladder cancer because the bladder cancer has different stages and when it becomes muscle invasive, it is pretty much it that you would live a little bit, six months to eight months. Now, if you go to doctor, physician, they would, what they would do if, if there's a muscle invasive cancer in the body, they would take out this bladder and they use these two ureters and connect that with a conduit, which is in the next slide. It is called, there are different ways to do it. One of the ways to do is bladder augmentation. They cut a small part of intestine and open it up and they, they basically remove the area where 
bladder cancer is and they make a pouch you can see from this systematic uh, system uh, schematic in the bladder so this is one way to do it when it is partially localized or partially invasive in the in the bladder when the surgeon does not know where the bladder cancer is or he knows that it is spread all over the place he would simply take it off when he takes the bladder off he needs to generate or create something for the urine to pass out in that case they need a tube and the tube is also created by this small intestine part now if you work in tissue engineering you would obviously think that we can use a scaffold and cells to create the conduit which is very true and i'm showing you one of the examples here it's a decellularized small intestine some mucosa coming from porcine that people have tried couple of years back it started in 2011 to 14 i believe in 14 the company got bankrupted it was coming from tony atala anthony atala is one of the pioneers in tissue engineering especially in neurological system so what they do is they create a conduit so literally they remove everything bladder seminal vesicles and all those things and they connect two ureters and make a tube it comes out of the stomach like the region of the stomach so how would you make a conduit they used for this particular example they used polylactic glycolic acid based copolymer with collagen spread on it and they use the same patient's adult adipose derived muscle cells and erythelial they did not do anything because you cannot take erythelial cells out of bladder erythelial cells are very localized they are found only in neurological system especially bladder so they could not isolate erythelial cells from the bladder because it is cancerous and they don't want to take a chance so in the conduit in the scaffold they use muscle cells and they implanted that the clinical trial went for bladder and conduit and it was not successful and the company got bankrupted i will come into why it was not successful and there are some other conditions for ureter and urethra you can imagine ureter is like 25 to 30 cm long tube it's literally a tube and urethra is also 20 cm for male and for female it is 4 cm so there are few benign conditions where you need to replace some part of ureter or urethra or full part of ureter so this is this is where we are coming from we want to generate a tube in simple words in engineering side we said tube we can imagine the bladder and ureter urethra they are like a water storage system it's a simplified version but you can imagine that so the tube is so simple if you think about it but in biological simple it becomes very complicated and it's it's kind of you know hard to say that we cannot even regenerate a tube a functional new functional tube tissue engineer tube so if you think about how it started where it, where we are right now in this field it is started let me see i would be able to see this so in japan this is this is what i call my, a historical milestone after world war 2 people simply physicians simply use plastic molds in 1958 and see and to observe whether the bladder was regenerated or not and they found that plastic mold caused several problems but it was good start whatever they had at that time then they moved to gelatin sponge 1967 and japanese paper japanese paper is a very thin paper i don't know how many it's very similar to typewriting paper long time back we used to have very thin paper white paper they used japanese paper and they coated with it uh, with a particular polymer acrylic polymer that has partial permeability to urea <clears throat> excuse me and they could they could get some nice results actually after that you can see that they just made a dome shape and they cut some part of the bladder where the bladder cancer was dominant and they left the the part where urethra is and they implanted that 
and they just let the body recover the whole tissue and i don't know how many of you know that bladder bladder is one of those organs where urethelium the epithelial cells can regenerate themselves very easily in rat studies they have shown authors have shown that bladder is one of those organs that can regenerate very nicely so we wanted i mean they wanted to take advantage of that and they did actually however it was not 100% successful uh, they claim that out of five four patients had bladder regenerated there were issues that i will come with um, in one slide then another milestone i would say that you would imagine bladder is like a balloon so why don't people why don't people use rubber like scaffold right which is very obvious question so this this is a very tiny study but it was very relevant for what we are doing it is coming from brazil they used natural latex natural rubber latex and they augmented the bladder and they found that the bladder got nice shape as it should be and it was compliant compliant means it can expand however using natural rubber even though it was not cross linked and it was purified it was in the latex form there was some issues with immune reaction now moving forward in 2006 i was talking about tony atala they used plga collagen you can see in the right side it's like a nice ball shaped scaffold and it was published in lancet actually lancet is top fiji i mean medical related journal with impact factor more than 50 almost 50 it has mostly clinical studies and this was published in that so a lot of hope was created with this work but in uh, in medicine as you know we have to follow the work up for few years to make sure that the implants are successful and it was not successful it was really terrible however the approach was very nice and they could do a lot of things and moving forward as we were talking about history human dura mater coming from our head it was it was uh, investigated in 1995 pericardium nice tissue which expand and contract in our heart in 2011 and a small submucosa intestinal submucosa they tried in 2013 14 amniotic membrane as well silk so basically you can imagine whatever biomaterials they have tried it so there's nothing lagging from biomaterial side that there are so many biomaterials cannot be used this or that so this is like more like engineering that we can make a scaffold we can seed it with cells and then try to regenerate it if you compile all the studies and find out what is there that it is lacking we find that urine leakage if you have a scaffold without cell urea leaks through it urine leaks through it and it creates a problem and the patient or you know animals they die and urethelium which is generated urethelium is a lining which protects the stroma from the urine and the toxic elements whatever it is present because urine is a waste product you can imagine that there are a lot of things that normal functioning organ would not like it urethelium was not completely regenerated in some cases there was case of grafts there were cases of graft shrinkage if you have a tube you put it in the body it shrinks it becomes smaller from both way diameter and the length side then the formation of fibrosis or scar tissue and the subsequent result is hydronephrosis kidney failure and there are a lot of stone formation calculi formation and most importantly even if you even the best condition we generated the tube a regenerated tube it was not mechanically functional our ureter and bladder they are like working as a pulsative motor or pulsative tube the urine goes through it and it has pulses which forces it to go now the biomaterial or the regenerated tissue also should do that if it does not do that it is basically not able to functional right and the urine can get blocked and hydronephrosis can happen it is not that important in the neurinary conduit because it's like a leaking system 
the urine just comes drop by drop, drop by drop, and gets collected in a pouch next to the stomach. We just need a passive tube kind of. Even then it is not successful. You can imagine that how complicated it can be. Now, if you think about an organ, it has different component, right? So erythelium is the lining which protects the stroma, the main tissue inside from the urine. And then you have muscle layers, there are a lot of collagen, there are vessels, blood vessels, neurons. We just think of a tube, but if you think of a tube, what is there? We have to regenerate all those components. If one of those components are missing, one of the components is missing, then we would have issue. We won't be able to generate a functional tissue. So that is the problem. Now, one of the problems that I'm going to discuss right now is I'm going to ask a question from you. What is so unique about the material property here? I'm talking about a bladder. I'm talking about a balloon. It's like, you know, very, a very soft system, very compliant and very strong. When it is unfilled, it collects urine and it keeps expanding and then suddenly stops so that there's an urge to pee. So the compliance is very important. And why does not urine leak? There's so much urine, it's like a half liter urine in our body when it is collected fully. It does not leak. It has to go through a proper channel. So why does not urine leak? Such a wonderful system, like a coating that you can imagine that it won't let water go through. Now, if you think about stress strain, you, most, of, most of you are engineers here, stress strain curve, there are two types of curve. One is called J curve, another is called S curve. So most of the materials, synthetic polymers, they, they exhibit a stress strain curve, which looks like this, very stiff kind of nature. And the rubbers, not all the rubbers, but biological systems, they are soft and they don't take too much stress to strain. They don't take too much stress to elongate. And then suddenly there's a rise in stress that it does not want to expand anymore. If I just quickly show you here, how this bladder is filling up with water. It's like a pouch, rubber, rubber balloon. Just see, expanding, expanding. And once it expands, the pressure rises. Before that, it is so easy to just, in this reason, it is so easy to fill it up, but after that it becomes very hard to fill it up. So this is typically a balloon. And why I'm showing you bladder because it's easier to imagine and show that than a tube. Now, if you go into the matrix, why bladder is doing it? There are a lot of proteins there and Collagen one and collagen three are important. Elastin is also important. Collagen is arranged in helical shape. It's like a spring. You have a ball pen and there's a spring. So when you compress it, it becomes smaller. And when you release the pressure, it becomes, it comes to, it comes back to the natural length. In bladder, what happens is the helical shape, when the urine is filling up, it expands and then when the urine is out, it collapses and comes back to the natural position. This is the, this is the mechanism how the bladder works. And elastin is helping collagen to move, move back faster. Elastin has limited role in the expansion, but it has major role in the contraction of the blood. When you see the urethelium, the lining, you can see this lining, how well connected these cells are. These are the cells. You can see the boundary. They are arranged in a very tight manner. This is, this is one of the most tightest lining in our body. When you zoom in on the cell surface, you would see there's a particular set of proteins called uroplakins. They are arranged in fractal like dimension, like hexagonal arrangement. They are tiny, tiny, tiny roughness on the surface. And this is important for their urine resistivity. So a lot of people have, have worked on this kind of things, but we'll move forward and see that what we know so far and where we are heading. We had a recent clinical trial. Um, uh, our collaborator, physician Trinity Biwalakwa, he was part of 
regenerating new urinary conduit. Now you see that this is a regenerated tube. It's coming from polylactic glycolic acid copolymer with adult, uh, adult muscle cells. The two ureters are connected to the tube over here, ureteral junction. And this next region is called proximal and a little bit more a mid and far away is distal. This the whole length is almost like 12 to 15 centimeter. And if you see the histology, trichrome, there are two holes here in the conduit. The two ureters are connected and then moving forward to different regions, you see how it is regenerated. By the time we see here, almost to distal, you see there are ingrowth of epithelial from our stomach, from the from patient's stomach. If you see the distal region a little bit here, you don't see muscle layer that much. Just zoom 40x, you can see there are not bundles of muscles present here. And urethelium is not very well, I'm, you cannot see probably very well, but you can see from the proximal region how well they are a nice pinkish red color, urethelium lining is present. And the smooth muscle cell bundles are there, which, is, which are needed for the contraction as well. But moving away from the ureteral junction, you don't see those structures. You don't see those components. So regenerating one centimeter of tissue is different than regenerating, you know, like a fit, like a foot uh, long tube or 10 centimeter or 15 centimeter. It's complicated. So the clinical trial also failed. All the patients had issues. Some of them died. Some of them had to replace the tube with the intestine part. Now you would say, if intestine is working, what is the point of doing this scaffolding, right? Intestine works mechanically, but over the time it creates a lot of problems because the intestine, intestine's job is to clear the food and it has a lot of inherent absorptive property, absorptive and secretory, uh, secretory properties. And that creates problems over the time and patients who have a small intestine conduit in their body, they develop kidney issues. There are a lot of issues after four or five years of their transplantation. So to make it better, we are working as, uh, we are working for tissue engineer conduit. So if you think about what is the role of material chemistry here, we have to consider different steps. How would we make a tube, right? What kind of material we would need and what is the biology, the interfacial relationship between biology and material science. So if you go back to PLGA, conduit, literally one of them is sitting in my office. This is a big tube and diameter is almost like one inch. If you degrade PLGA in phosphate buffer saline at 37 degrees Celsius, you would see the stress strain curve. The stress strain curve looks like a stiff material. And over the time, since the material starts degrading, you would see there's a loss of mechanical property. Now, why it is important? You want to create a system which was compliant and you are using a material which is, which is rigid. And the material is not able to resist urine leakage. If, it, if in 14 days it's degrading itself and the mechanical properties is going down, there's no control where, the, where PLGA would degrade. So there are a lot of tiny holes over the time and a lot of urine leakage. So see, even this went through the clinical trial, but if you ask me as a biomaterial, I would never go ahead with the clinical trial of this PLGA material. It does not make sense to me. You have to have a lining first and you have to use a material which is similar to the body. Now there are different arguments that you know, stiff materials are better for regenerating muscle, uh, muscle bundles, but it did not work, right? So we have to go back and check what we are missing here. Now the first thing you would observe, our body is full of collagen. Physiological tissues are made of collagen. So why not collagen? Why don't we use only collagen or collagen and something? They use collagen to make sure that cells are adhering well. 
they did not use collagen as a base scaffolding material. Okay, let's see. Now, if you think about collagen, a lot of benefits are there. It's a physiological relevant material. Food and Drug Administrator Administration has approved collagen for many applications, not for regeneration of urological system or urological organs, but it is approved for many things. It is available in the form of recombinant collagen uh, coming from human fibroblast. You can make it in the lab. It is coming from animal sources. There are a lot of variety of sources that you can have. But collagen does not make a nice tube. I mean, so far they were not able to do it. So that was one thing. And then would, it, would the tube have the right set of mechanical properties that we are looking for, like a, rubber, like a balloon? And they should be surgically durable. It means you can suture them and it should last enough so that uh, cells can remo uh, remodel things. So in our first publication, uh, we came up with a process design that could make a collagen tube, a strong collagen tube. It's just not a flimsy hydrogel. It is a hydrogel, but super strong because it is condensed. We create a, it's like, you know, mixture of vacuum thermoforming and compression molding. So we created a tube of rubber balloon and then we, pull, uh, we put the collagen mixture. When it neutralizes, it makes fibers and then we compressed it. We suck the vacuum and a lot of collagen comes together and they become super condensed. And it was published in Advanced Healthcare Materials. And in addition, we could, we could create a lot of designs. Before that, people had a hard time creating different designs in super strong collagen. So we could, we could create tubes with different design. You can see star shape, multiple, um, multiple folded regions. And then we could also create tiny holes inside the tube, the wall of the tube. And we, we also worked with a collaborator. He was a physician. He worked with pediatric, pediatric patients to create a small intestine. And a small intestine has tiny proteins. We could create all those things as well. So this was the beginning of our work that we wanted to approach it step by step, as I was saying you. And then the next thing was making collagen compliant, right? So if you see one of this video, so what I'm doing is I'm stretching a tiny piece of collagen and it's like a rubber band. You can literally take out rubber bands and just keep doing it. I wanted to make this and how was it possible? And this material is suturable as well. So you can see this, this is a rabbit bladder holding almost 150 to 200 gram weight on the suture. And our material, which is shown in the um, rightmost side is also able to hold almost 200 grams of the material. So if we could make it, this was a good start. This is like, you know, a starting point that we can use this as a scaffold. So how would you make it? To, sur to basically, to our surprise as well, we were working to make collagen more urine resistive and we found that if we use long chain aliphatic molecules, the, the collagen became a new polymer kind of system. It became rubbery. So literally you dip a collagen scaffold, not heavily cross-linked ones, just dip into a solution with a long chain aliphatic molecule with some reactive group. Here is NHS and hydroxy succinamide or succinic anhydride. And the whole thing would become rubbery after you process it. So that was quite surprising. And the reason why we wanted to do it is we wanted to make collagen more urine resistive. And you can imagine that why we are bringing aliphatic chains here because aliphatic chains can repel some water. Now, why it would happen? You can think about transient cross-linking. If you take a poly polymer, for example, polyacrylamide, polyacrylamide is not very compliant or we're not very rubbery-like, but you can make it rubbery when you, when you make a copolymer of polyacrylamide or modify the NH2 group, 
in the polymer with some big aliphatic chain. So what happens is the hydrophobic groups, they come together in the system and the hydrophilic groups, they are separate. So they are tiny, tiny domains of this hydrophobic units and they act as a transient cross-linking. You can pull them a little bit, it will get disturbed and you leave it, they would come back and they form the domains. So we don't have to make permanent cross-linking. We just have to make, we have to just give a system, we have to give the system a um, space where they can rearrange themselves. So this is what it is happening. And surprisingly, with carbon chain size of more than C9, to, I have, we have checked C20 till C20, it works, but below C9, it does not work. So you cannot use C6, carbon chain length C6, for making rubbery, uh, rubbery collagen. When you see the TM images, uh, first you can see nice band-like pattern in collagen. This is very characteristic of collagen fiber, collagen uh, type one. And when you do the reaction with these aliphatic molecules, there are some band-like structures. Not every molecule has reacted, but you can see the diffused structure as well, like MR first kind of structure. When the collagen is more or less fully reacted, you can see a lot of fibril like structure. Some of them are folded and you can see white and black. Now you would see, maybe it is like gelatin like structure, right? Because it might just denature itself and gelatin becomes a random coil chain and it can elongate more. But if you see gelatin in TEM, uh, the structure is not the same as what you would see for the modified collagen. So what does it mean, right? Does it help in our compliance, increasing the compliance of the scaffold? So of course we can check it with tan, uh, tan delta measurement, how stable it is and what is the storage modulus and loss modulus. You would see the collagen itself is shown as blue one here at 37 degrees Celsius, it is stable. When it is, when it is this particular one, uh, when you just take a tiny sheet of the collagen and run a rheometer on it, around 60 degrees Celsius, it melts. Our material, which we modified, shown in the red and the green one, one what we made, it just melts around 37 degrees Celsius. So not very ideal because in our body, we would need that stability. If we don't have that stability at 37 degrees Celsius, it is no, of new, no use. So what we did, we just vitrified the collagen first. So what you have is you make a collagen sheet and dry it enough so that water is more or less gone. Not too dry. If you dry too much, there's a strong hydrogen bonding formation and there's generation of internal cross-linking, then the reaction does not happen. So you just have to dry enough to bring collagen molecules very close and then do the reaction. And once the reaction, is hap once the reaction has happened, you get a system, collagen-based you know, system, which is very stable even at you know, 40 degree, 45 degrees Celsius. You can see the storage model is still there. And it, even if it at around 60 degrees Celsius, it loses strength. You can literally, it's not like a liquid. At, at 60 degrees Celsius, collagen becomes like a liquid. It just dissolves in water because it gelatinizes. But our material, it, it do, never does that. You always have a sheet present even at higher temperature. And when you decrease the temperature, it goes back to the same initial strength. Similar to storage modulus, we have the loss modulus. And then tan delta would show you that at 37 degrees Celsius, whether it is solid or liquid, if tan delta is more than one, it will be liquid. If it is less, it will be solid. So for uh, native collagen at 60 degrees Celsius, around 60 degrees Celsius, you see that how suddenly it becomes liquid. There's a sharp jump. And for our material that we tried, the temperature is around 40 degrees Celsius. And the vitrified sample, which was modified, it does not even become liquid. So depending on the design condition, we can make collagen, mod modified collagen, which is more stable. Here's some example. The left, left one you are seeing rabbit bladder, how it expands, and the right one you are seeing modified collagen. 
we can literally put water into it and it becomes like a balloon. And I showed you this suture strength thing I have before already. If you see the stress versus strain curve, uh, I would guide you through this. Rabbit bladder, if you take rabbit bladder and pull it, do stress, tensile stress, strain, you would see that curve looks like this nice J curve. It, it goes almost like 125 to 130% of elongation. And collagen scaffold, what you can make in the lab or you buy it, it's like a stiff material. It only elongates till 30% or 35%, depending on how you, what is the strain rate and other things. It, it does not go more than 30%. If you take a decellularized material, like pericardium, bovine pericardium, it is also a stiff material. It elongates around 25%, 30%. But if you modify with aliphatic chains, long chain aliphatic chains, you would see that what happens to collagen. The green one becomes this one. It elongates till 400%. If you do the same thing with decellularized pericardium, you get a material which also has a J shape, but you can almost elongate to 110%. So from 30, we can make 110%. Even decellularized materials which are available in the market, FDA approved. If you see the suture strength, the suture strength of collagen is almost 30, 30 to 40, which is at the boundary line. If you don't have a strong collagen, it would break during suturing. But our material is still able to sustain it. And when you suture it and pull it, it keeps going, which is good because at the interface of the bladder and the material, when the urine fills, it has to stretch. So in that way, it is good system. So we are able to see good suture strength. So it is clinically durable. Um, we, we also try different materials. Again, I said you, decellularized extracellular matrices coming from small intestine of mucosa, urinary bladder matrix, bovine pericardium, bovine dermis, human dermis, all of these materials we have tried. And we are able to see that our a strategy of creating transient cross-linking or modifying the material with long chain aliphatic molecules is able to enhance the elongation of the material, which is needed. This is our hypothesis that we wanted to create a compliant material, more elongated, more stretchable material. So for example, for, ref for your reference, I'm showing you the strain stress, stress strain curve of rabid bladder which is shown at the light, uh, right most at the bottom corner, rabbit bladder you see, it is able to stretch itself almost 125% before it breaks. So the red line, what you're show, uh, seeing in all of these curves or graphs is basically the reference point for the bladder. You need almost 125% of elongation at 0.35 megapascal. That is our bottom line. If we can create a material, with 0.35 megapascal and 125, that is a good start. So what we see from all these curves, that some materials are able to qualify those criteria, And we see bovine pericardium is almost able to go 115% at 0.3 megapascal. So we created a material, we buy this material and we modify it and it becomes bladder-like. It is a stretchable, at the same time, it has all those benefits that we would love to have, the biological cues that it would have from decellularized origin. Another good thing what we found is these materials when examined for macrophage polarization, M1 and M2, some of you probably know this, that we need M2 macrophages for regenerative support. M1 is more inflammatory and M2 is more regenerative. So we were looking for a material that also has some M2, that also modulates M2 polarization, meaning that they are supporting the regeneration process. So we find that for all modified material, we have positive trend. It is going to our M2 from M1, but bovine pericardium, modified bovine pericardium somehow is the most efficient in M2 polarization. It has decreased TNF alpha, which is an M1 kind of 
polarizing very significantly. So we thought we have a, a we have a system which is compliant. At the same time, it is available in the market. We can buy it FDA approved. We can you know the FDA application would be so complicated because just a simple modification, and it is also helping in regeneration process because there is a polarization of macrophages into M2. Now, if you would see that why I have been using aliphatic molecules, small molecules, right? Why did not create a complicated system? I can create a complicated system in the lab, but at the end, going to the clinics, we have to consider FDA approval, how much it would cost and all those things. So if you think about it, this is a very clean system, very simple system. You take a system or a scaffold, which is FDA approved, you bring it to the lab, very simple reaction within, with a with long chain aliphatic molecule. And that gives you another scaffold, which is suitable for bladder regeneration. And it does not cause, you know, inflammatory immune reaction. So the chances that it would get approved, the chances that it will be successful in clinic is very high. And that is why we always look for systems that would be like that. I hope that helps you, your curiosity that why such a simplified system. So when we implanted this in bladder, I'm showing you pericardium. I will be showing you pericardium and small intestine submucosa because the small intestine submucosa is heavily studied in the literature. It is, the potential of SIS was very high. And pericardium is also considered very ideal candidate for bladder regeneration. That's why we are using pericardium and SIS. So when you see the control, when the bladder is just cut and stitched back and then pericardium, control and the modified pericardium. You could see the regeneration of urethelium here. You see the urethelium is regenerated and their lamina propria, LM is lamina propria, UR is urethelial. And you would also see some bundles of muscles, the red bundles in the deep blue matrix. And the blue matrix is collagen. Uh, muscle bundles are tiny bundles, red color bundles in all of them. But compared to pericardium, modified pericardium had more. So it generated mostly all the components. I mean, you can ask me about the blood vessels. You can see some blood vessels as well in the next slide. Uh, we did not find too many nerves because nerves take more time to regenerate. So if it is not there, it's not like you know end of the world because a lot of materials, what they have been studied within the time frame of 28 days uh, to 56 days, they don't see that many. And they are in general very sparse. So if you see this, you will see the immunohistochemistry of control, cystectomy control, pericardium control, and modified uh, pericardium. We maintain is synthetic smooth muscle cell marker, which is sitting just underneath the erythelium. Erythelium is nicely generated in cystectomy control, and you see smooth muscle act in bundles, which are necessary for giving it strength and contractility. CD31 marks for blood vessels. You can see nice blood vessels just sitting in the lamina propria. And CK20 is marker for superficial urethelial cells. That is needed for the urine resistivity. Now, in you, when you see pericardium, the urethelial is partially regenerated because it's only 28 days. <clears throat> some parts can regenerate, some parts, they only have few urethelial cells. But you see, you see the blood vessels as well. You see some uh, muscle bundles. When you see bovine pericardium, you see hyperplastic erythelial, erythelial cells. Erythelium is regenerated, but they seem like they are like in a condition where they just want to regenerate. They are hyperplastic. And you also have a lot of tiny bundles of smooth muscle actin. And then you see nice bundles of blood vessels, nice you know, circular blood vessels. And the erythelium is also marked with some CK20, not everywhere, but it has superficial cells. Those are very important for urine resistivity. So this particular material is able to support regeneration of giving you all the components that you would need, more or less. 
Now, we went ahead with a small intestine submucosa for four months. And what we see, you see the trichrome and histology, uh, sorry, HNE. Trichrome is the left side one, the blue, blue uh, color, and the HNE was, HNE is the pink one. So you can see from cystectomy control, SIS control, and SIS modified. What you see, if you zoom in, you see urethelial layer, UR is urethelial. In the cystectomy control, it is nicely uh, lined in three, uh, three categories, lumin uh, luminal urethelials, intermediate urethelial, and basal cells. You can see just three, three uh, cells in urethelium, three or four. And you would see some big cells. You can see from here, there's a superficial cell sitting. They are giant cells. They, they are of 100 micrometer size. They can stretch themselves. They can contract themselves. They make the lining, which is important for the urinary digestivity. In pericardium control, you see they are, uh, the erythelium, uh, erythelial layer is thicker, and it has a lot of cells. We have not marked for superficial cells, so we don't know here. In the modified pericardium, we also see similar, but it's not exactly like control, but it is not too thick as well. And we believe that it does have superficial cells. You can see some big cells sitting on the top. And the lamina propria, which is very important for expansion of the bladder, in the cystectomy control, you see nice diffused collagen sitting and some uh, blood vessels, tiny blood vessels. In the pericardium control, this is also like this. Just a second. And then uh, in the modified pericardium, you also see uh, blood vessels and uh, muscle cells. If you see the detrusal muscle uh, component, this collagen is surrounding the muscle bundle. And this is also true in the pericardium control and the cystectomy control. But you would see closely and find that muscle bundles are not that arranged as you would like to see in the cystectomy control. You see they are like ni nice bundles which are surrounded by collagen. It's not present in the pericardium control as well as modified pericardium. You can say maybe a little bit in modified pericardium, but not so definitely in the SIS control. So what does that mean? That means that we are able to create urethelium for you know, resistivity of urine, but somehow the muscle bundles are not creating very well. And this is, we are talking about one centimeter size, right? So if you're talking about 10 centimeter size, what would happen? So this is a challenge. Even the compliance is not able to have all the properties that we would like to have. So moving forward, what we would do? We will have to think about, right? <clears throat> so I told you a story that we try to cover one part of one aspect of the bladder and how far we can go. It is so complicated. You have to consider blood vessel regeneration. You have to consider the contractility. You have to consider ethereum regeneration. You have to consider nerve regeneration. You have to consider that muscle bundles are functional. So different aspects we have to cover. We just cannot have a scaffold and think that it will work. We have to give cells the most efficient system, like students who are working in MIT, if you don't have a good lab to work, if you don't have good syllabus to work, you can perform well, but you can only perform that much. But if you are given all the facilities in your MIT, which you have, you can, you have potential to do very well. Now that's what we are trying to do, making a scaffold as suitable as possible for cells to give you the best result. Moving forward, we thought this system should work not only with collagen, decentralized matrices, but also with gelatin. Why gelatin? Gelatin, if you don't cross-link it, it does not have any structural strength at 37 degrees Celsius, which is important, right? So we could create the material, uh, gelatin-based material, like a tube-like material, and we can make like a rope, very flexible. So a material which, which is stable at 37 degrees Celsius, it elongates like rubber, it has suture strength, would find utility in many biomedical applications. I'm not showing a video here because it would take some more time, but you can see I made a film of collagen, modified collagen, so we can make film as well. And I'm showing you 
storage models, loss models, data, and tensile strength here. The red one, what you see is cross-link gelatin, with, which was modified with aliphatic chain. You can see around 37 degrees Celsius slowly starts going down. That means that if you keep at 37 degrees Celsius for a long time, it would start losing strength a little bit. And then we have gelatin control, which is pink one, at around 30 degrees Celsius, it's just like it loses all the strength. That means that it is not stable at physiological temperatures. You can modify a little bit more. You can modify the carboxylic acid group of gelatin and block that. It helps in uh, uh, enzymatic degradation. It makes it more stable. So what I'm trying to show you is, if you go to tan delta here in the rightmost side, the upper right, right side, tan delta value, it should not be more than one, you know, within like 37 to 50 degrees Celsius to make it more stable in as implants. So you see that the pink one around 30 degrees Celsius just becomes liquid and you get random data for tan delta. That means it's liquid. But none of our material below 50 degrees Celsius became liquid. That means it is stable. When you do the stress, tensile stress experiment, you see how gelatin is able to expand to 120 degree percent, 120%, but uh, at very low uh, stress, that is good, but it should be stable, otherwise it won't work. But if you use gelatin, uh, modify gelatin, you can get a very nice curve, which is almost going to 0.35 megapascal, and it elongates almost 300%. And you can do the hysteresis curve as well, like multiple times you can do it. So we are able to create a gelatin waste material, which is a cheap material, right? And FDA approved for many purposes. We can make it more compliant and more stable. Now, one of the things you would uh, imagine is it can be used as a bubble gum or chewing gum, which can degrade as well because it blows. I literally had a, a picture which would show you that we can blow the balloon of modified gelatin. And this, this slide is showing you the urine resistivity. We did modified gelatin for urine resistivity study. The reason is it's easy to mold. If you take collagen and modify it, whatever shape it is, it is fixed there. We cannot do much. So for this experiment, we use gelatin because we can literally pour gelatin, modified gelatin and make a thin film of it and calculate how much it is resisting urea to sip through it. What you find is higher the number uh, in the right side, you see the number at 24 hour, 141, 107, 164. Higher this number is, more urea it is letting to go through. Now I want to show you this SIS, which is a biomaterial that has been heavily studied. It lets you, it let, the urea goes through it quite a bit. You can see 164, even more than gelatin, just gelatin. It was done at room temperature because we could not compare otherwise if you do 37 degrees Celsius. Gelatin C18, which is modified gelatin, you see the number is only 107. And a control, urease is an enzyme which degrades urea into ammonia. So if you have an enzyme system which would keep chopping urea into tiny pieces, how much urea it lets go through. You see the number is 65. And if you cross-link gelatin, if you make a cross-link system, you still have a high number, right? So gelatin C18, which is 107 compared to SIS 164, which people have used for clinical studies, in uh, preclinical studies in animals, it is able to resist urea in that way. So that is good. That we will expect because <clears throat> aliphatic chains are you know, blocking water and any water or a little bit more bigger molecule to sip through it. And if you use FITC, FITC is, you know, fluorophore, a bigger molecule, it also does not let fluorophore go that much. You can see that it just, there's a concentration of fluorophore on the top layer. It was done in the transwell. So we add urea solution on top and let it sip through and we collect the sample from the bottom and measure it. So it is showing us those properties that we need. It may not be the perfect yet, but we are still moving forward. 
And when we implanted this material in sub-Q, uh, sub-Q rats, you see the blue one here, trichrome. This material is still intact after 21 days. You don't see any cell infiltration. I don't have the zoom images right now, but literally there's no cell penetrating inside this material. So this material is like acting as a polymer wax. You can imagine it's like a pseudo inert material. So potentially it can be used in, uh, in places where there was a tumor and tumor had to be removed and there's a hole there and you have to fill that place so that it looks normal. And those things can be, uh, th in those places, this material can be used as well. I want to show you a quick, another story. I know that we are running out of time. Uh, hope we still have time, Dr. Pahari, just a little bit more. I think yes, we can have, uh, yeah, you can, you can continue, please. So thank you. So this, this story is about nature, right? We, we see so many wonderful things in nature. Just look at this species. What you are seeing in this species, probably you have already guessed it by now. There are organs, there are systems that they can literally balloon. Look at the puffer fish. It's a fish. It balloons, it's up like a, like a balloon. But this species are nice, this species are ni nice, but we won't be able to do any experiments with this. Especially puffer fish we can do, but people have already done that. But those birds and siamang, we, it's just complicated, right? Collecting those species and doing experiments with that. So let's go back to the system where we can do something about it. Look at this. Everybody knows this basic biology, right? A lot of frogs can make sound. Male frogs can make sound to attract females. They make very nice sound and they're very tiny. These are some of the species. I'm just pointing to E. Kuki. Kuki is a sound. They make Kuki, Kuki. They just keep saying Kuki, Kuki to attract females. They can use this gullery skin their throat area, and they make it so big, they pump their, the, they pump air and they store air there, and they do it very quickly, cookie, cookie, cookie. So just like unbelievable. And you see they're like the transparent. It's just like literally a polymer, like a kid is playing with balloon. Now, why I'm interested in that? I want to know if it is hard to make a helical system in the collagen at the molecular level, or micromolar, micrometer size level. Can we learn something from nature? And this cookie or this particular frog should have some mechanism why it is able to blow its you know, skin that much, blow the skin. So this was a motivation. We wanted to see this. So the basic thing you can see, just bring the ribbed bladder without field, uh, the contracted bladder and the expanded bladder. And you see the frog when the air is not too much there versus it's filled with air. You see how much expansion it is happening. When we calculate it, it is like eight times more expansion. So almost going to, it's not exactly the relationship, but you can imagine it is going almost 200% um, elongation linearly. That corresponds to eight times in the volume, more or less. When you see the stress strain curve, you see the rat bladder is the black one, black curve here, and the E cookie gular skin, the pink is for the female and the blue is for the male. It's almost going to 400%. Now you would see that these curves can change because the way the parameters are chosen, how fast you are stretching it. And we did the uniaxial tensile testing, not the biaxial, because these tissues are so tiny, the frogs are very tiny. So we, we did not have enough sample to do biaxial testing to see exactly how much it is, what is the volume of the blown up gular skin. Just for the comparison that how well it is able to stretch. So this was published recently. One of my master's students was the lead author of it. And when you do the histology, you would see the male cookie and female cookie. They have nice collagen arranged and they don't have many obstructions in the structure. 
But when you take control frogs, they don't have the cooler skin, means that they don't have to use their throat area to make sound. You would see that they are always with some muscle bundles and they have obstructions. You see that they are ridges and they have glands. In the rat bladder, if you see, this is lamina propria, this is urethelium. Here you can see in trichrome, the blue color is collagen and its muscle bundle is the red color or pink is and urethelium is there. So when you zoom in more by TM, male E. Cookie has what kind of structure? You see they are like layerings, zigzag layering. You see here, female has some, but not exactly like male because female, they don't make sound. Even though they have potential to balloon up their throat, but they don't make sound. And control, uh, control species, XL and XM, they have ridges. You can see that the continuity is broken. When you zoom in in the male E. cookie, you would see that Z structure is three dimensional. Collagen fibers are going this way and suddenly they, they tilt and they become like this. So they have more room to stretch. And this is the mechanism how they are working. In female, it is not exactly zigzag, but it is also folded. And in the control species, collagen bundles are in layers and they are ridged, means they are discontinuous. So you can expand only that much because those are stress point. After that, they won't uh, elongate. So this was nice to learn that uh, we don't only have to make helical structure. In the rat bladder, you can see nice helical structure. The collagen is coming and it tilts and goes inside the plane. You see the parallel to plane and goes inside the plane. And what also, uh, we also found that elastin is eight times less in this E. cookie samples than the rat bladder, eight times less. And collagen is double than the rat bladder. So it's a different you know, organ, of course, a different species, but they have developed, they have evolved with some structures that would let them do ballooning. So we really don't have to only think about helical structure, which is possible in rats or human in the bladder. We can also think of some structures which would give you more um, stretchability. Now people have done zigzag structure. People could create some zigzag structure in the lab, but they never could make more than 100% uh, percent in long -term. Now you would see that these are more important in bladder because urin urinary conduit, the tube does not have to elongate uh, like rubber balloon, right? But whenever we do studies, we always have to have a reference point, which is bladder. We examine the material for its regenerative potential in the bladder. So we try to mimic the bladder. If we can get a bladder or a tiny piece of bladder, regenerated one, which functions, we would be able to get a tube as well. So that is the reference point we are coming from. <clears throat> Just two more slides. I wanted to show you what currently we are doing. Those are the stories about the biomaterials. But we are going in, de uh, in detail that how this regeneration process is happening in the bladder. I'm not studying the embryonic, embryonic stages, but adult. We often do surgeries in young rats, right? Young adults rats, not in the old ones. But patients who come for these surgeries, they are 60s or older. So we are just not considering the aging thing here. We just want to create in young, and we want to translate in old. That is not correct as well. So what happens to the system when you try to regenerate in young, young animals versus aged animals? When you implant a scaffold, what happens at day one, three, day seven, day 24? What kind of cells are coming into it? What kind of transcriptomes are, I mean, like, what kind of transcriptomes, transcriptome profile is changing? how it is changing, what RNAs are expressing, getting expressed or depressed, repressed. So you can see this plot, this is called TSNE plot, single cell sequencing. You can literally isolate cells from the bladder, from the scaffold and do the transcriptomic study on that. What kind of RNAs we need for an ideal regeneration 
versus what we are using with the scaffolds. There are a lot of different cells. Are those cells coming? Right? And after a few months in the control, the, the pulsative motion is there. The mechanical properties have the right set of you know, um, parameters. But in a scaffold-based system, we don't have that. Why? Are we missing any cells there? Are we missing any particular RNA? Or how was the profile? All those studies we are doing right now, a single cell sequencing, you can see some of the images that here. It's more bioinformatics during the processing. So we, we expect to get those results soon, uh, maybe in a month. We already are in processing. Animals are uh, already they have undergone surgery and we are going to collect the cells and do the single single sequencing, next generation sequencing. We are also studying bladder cancer phenotype. I just showed you one of these images. You can see the luminal side. Luminal is marked with black color and the basal is marked in the white dotted line. In bladder cancer, it can be luminal type or basal type. Basal type is more aggressive, meaning that basal cancer becomes more aggressive and once it metastasizes, it becomes very dangerous. Basically, it's very lethal. But luminal cancer, they just try to be on the top of it. They can become aggressive and they are aggressive, but compared to basal, they are less aggressive. So why so? So we are trying to do single cell sequencing on that in a BBN model, in a toxin that creates a carcinogen that creates uh, bladder cancer in rats or mice. You can imagine the urethelial lining is protecting the stroma from urine and urine has a lot of things. So if you feed a rat BBN, it can go through, I mean, BBN particular model is going through the blood, but in, in, urea, uh, in urine, there are so many things happening. Why? why urethelial is there because it wants to protect the stroma from urine so the lumina lumina is the most exposed layer it's to foreign entities to toxins so their profiling of cancer would be different than the basal because they are more exposed to blood so there should be some differences in reactive oxygen species why reacting reactive oxygen species because reactive oxygen species is one of the ways that these urethelial cells protect the stroma. So in, if there's a difference between luminal bladder cancer versus bladder, basal bladder cancer, our hypothesis is reactive oxygen species, which are mostly here expressed by luminal cells a lot, it should be different. So we are studying reactive oxygen species, effect of reactive oxygen species on bladder cancer phenotype. So a lot of single cell sequencing we are doing now. Uh, so my lab is working on biomaterials at the same time, going into deep to study at the cell level that what we are doing. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my great students. My lab was filled with a lot of master student, and PhD student and postdocs for some time. What I want to say by master students, you know, master students are in transition. They are learning research but they are not mature enough, but they are getting mature. PhD students are, they can do independent research studies after their three years of PhD or four years of PhD. My master students have been very successful publishing papers because I invest, I invest myself in them. I really want them successful, become successful. And some of them have founded their own companies. Some, some of them are working in different companies uh, like Avi and Allegan and some of them move forward with their PhDs. So there, there's a long list. Of course, I want to acknowledge Department of Urology, my funding sources, NIH R21 Trailblazer Award, Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute Award. And uh, I used to work with eyes, dry eye. So Cooper Vision, a contact lens company, oh, they also founded us. So a lot of, Gratitude for all those people who have, helped, who have helped or who have worked in the lab. And uh, I also thank Dr. Mukherjee 
for being as a mentor, as a friend throughout of my career. You can imagine that why I was stressing as masters because I was a master student <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how the journey has progressed throughout. So people who are looking for postdoctoral position, I would definitely encourage them to apply. The only thing right now is because of COVID-19, everything is frozen. Uh, there's no hiring going on. Uh, so you might have to wait till a couple of more months. Hopefully the vaccine would come soon. So maybe by October or November, we should have uh, a clear idea that can we hire more postdocs depending on the grants as well. So keep looking and uh, be inspired what you're doing. And with that, I would like to, you know, uh, ask or answer any questions that you would have. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anirudh. Uh, is there any opportunity for PhD students as well? So for PhD students, they go through the department, right? For postdoc, it is easier. The PI, the principal investigator, the professors, they, they, they can directly hire them. Okay. They just have to do paperwork with the department and the university. But for PhD students, this is, since it's a degree, you have to go through the admission department and they okay. have particular criteria. Like you have to have some experience in writing, some experience in publishing or what kind of research you have done. Does it yeah. match with the research, what people are doing in the lab, in the lab, in the department and how they have been doing like GPA wise. There are a lot of things. So application process, they probably know GRE and TOEFL they have to uh, give. So you have to go to the PEP side of Hopkins in the department, biomedical or chemical biomolecular or in biology department or cellular molecular biology department and okay. see if you qualify. I would definitely say one thing. If you have a publication under your name in authorship, it yeah. would improve the chances quite a bit okay. because they like to see that. Okay. So it's open for uh, question answers for the forum. So if you want, you can unmute yourself or uh, the person who is here, you can, he can help you or you can raise your hand and ask questions. Any questions, please? You can ask any questions even regarding your PhD or postdoc, whatever you want. I'm, I'm a PI, but at the same time, I'm a mentor too. I want your success. I want Absolutely. people to be very successful and our success is related to your success. This is my philosophy of my teaching and my mentorship. So don't be shy. There's no wrong question. Otherwise, you can write to Dr. Singh and uh, I can provide you the email ID for any queries. Anybody else any for the questions? Aarti is there. Sujata is there. They should ask Yeah, questions. Aarti, Sujata, Dakshi. Dakshi is there. Oh, Dakshi is there too, right? Ah, Dakshi got her uh, master's degree. Uh, I think she will be starting from January in Carnegie Mellon. So, oh, how nice. <laughs> She did not tell me. She had to tell me, right? Uh, she just got the offer. Uh, she will okay. be telling you. She said that she will be writing you soon about it. <laughs> Very good. So I'm good to see that MIT, University, MIT students are coming, you know, to yeah. higher studies. Carnegie is very good. Um, in, uh, it's in yeah. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, not far away. Yeah, it's in Pittsburgh. And uh, she's also working right now with me with some projects. And uh, Aarti is about to submit her thesis. Sujata will be soon submitting once she completes the another paper. So mm -hmm. uh, students, if you have questions, I see one question. Who is that? Let me see. I can only say that I was one of you long time back. So don't get scared <laughs> to ask. Yati, yes, Aarti, you have a question. Kindly unmute Aarti. Kindly, uh, Mainak, please unmute Aarti so that she can ask the question. Or Aarti, if you can write it down in the chat section. Aarti, please write it down in the chat section. She's writing. Okay. Yeah. 
her question is regarding polymer aging inside the human body yes you can you can always think that way as well uh, how, how will it, it will affect the implant in long run right so there are two things and since you asked about polymer aging like in polymer we always studied temperature relationship with time right time temperature superposition principle that how long it would last at that particular temperature that is a good question normally in biomedical engineering we don't think about that because we are not keeping them for more than one year especially when we are trying to regenerate system some implants like bone implants um, they can be there for long time like uh, titanium plates right so in to answer your question we don't study that polymer aging we don't study that but uh, definitely it can be studied some people have studied their degradation profile so you can relate to that why it degrades what kind of molecules it releases over the time is it harmful to the body or not even polyethylene glycol which is considered pseudo inert or inert polymer and due to the fenton reaction inside the body it degrades and it creates some free radicals and some immune response so it is good way to uh, look what happens to our polymer over the time but in general we don't worry because we are focused on uh, like 4 months or 3 months not more than 6 months for regeneration i hope that answers any more questions another Sujata, question data tania dr singh i have a questions oh. i am dr patra hi ranjan how are you i am fine so you have tried with collagen so did you isolate the collagen or you um, buy it so answer is we buy it but of course you can isolate as well buying is easier because it comes into purified form into toxin free so okay. we just uh, we just get rid of all those stuff that we don't want to deal with yeah and another you, you just uh, mix with collagen as there are long aliphatic chains now yes Uh, now the question is that so that did you try with some aromatic chains because aromatic have the property of gelatinous property much more than that of the aliphatic property aliphatic so did you try with that so the answer is no we did not try it because so just trying aromatic groups in the collagen there is no hypothesis building up that why it would become a uh, wire would form transient cross linking but you can you can ask me that in aliphatic chain itself at the end groups we can have a few aromatic groups and see what happens okay. but uh, that is a good point that we never tried it we never thought that way that why we would like aromatic groups wow and uh, when you are uh, mixing with collagens and the uh, aliphatic chain so you are telling that there is some hydrogen bonding interaction between the A collagen and the aliphatic chain that will makes the polymer much more strain i think uh, so, so the, how how the hydrogen bonding affects uh, the strain property of your polymers so in na in native collagen there are a lot of hydrogen bondings that's why it does not want to elongate right uh, it just is strong and suddenly it breaks so what happens when we use aliphatic chains it breaks that hydrogen bonding you know formation inside the collagen system okay. now the aliphatic chains they are hydrophobic units so they want to come together so hydrophobic interaction yeah so hydrophobic interaction is one way so yeah. we are trying to compensate hydrogen bonding with hydrophobic now hydrophobic interaction is working for us for elongation because we can stretch them and we when we leave them they come together and they still they want to come together it's like soap right the osmo hydrophobic interaction so it just we are breaking the the balance of interaction there are a lot of hydrophobic interaction in collagen as well because of the amino acids hydrogen bonding secondary wall secondary interactions so we are breaking those baseline and creating a system which works sufficiently for elongation oh, so number of questions have come so uh dr patra are you through or should i continue yes yes i have finished i have yeah. finished so daksh dakshi has asked one question uh, he she writes very interesting talk sir can micro patterning or nano patterning also be used to achieve the kind of mechanical properties that are required for urinary bladder tissue engineering 
yes and no yes in the sense that you can do macro patterning of collagen nano patterning of collagen but you can imagine that that patterning in three dimensional setting like a bladder or tube nobody has shown that it's not possible you can just create a film and examine the property of the film that is why we wanted to look for alternative system like zigzag structure uh, what i am talking about people have created uh, in north carolina they have created films of it right very thin they can show that we can pattern in that shape helical shape they are not able to electro spin of collagen with sufficient strength so there are a lot of issues i won't say it is impossible but it is not possible so far it has not been possible so far so that is why we are lacking that kind of scaffold and we are looking for some alternative ways and then uh, then tanya is asking ha what type of test yeah. we can perform right what we, what kind of test we perform the testing implants immuno response so there are a lot of ways right uh, we do flow cytometry we do immuno histochemistry and uh, we can also if you talk about implants right uh, we also do blood isolation and check the profiling of the entire body is released and uh, the cytokines cytokines which are released and based on that we can profile how it is interacting so these are all established system mostly physicians do that if they have implant in the body they would make sure that it is not causing any issues normally they do check with urine and blood profiling and neeta is asking what is the self life of conduit and has it been used in patients the answer is we we have not used our conduit so far i think it would take some time uh self life of conduit i would say i have kept on the gelatin material modified gelatin material at 37 degrees celsius in phosphate buffer saline for 2 months and we have not seen like disappearance of the scaffold or anything and in presence of enzymes the concentration of enzymes uh, would dictate how much degradation is happening and we have found it is very similar to decelerized matrices that we would use so nothing uh, like negative in that way and uh, let's see sujata is thank you and uh, regarding immune response how it can be dealt so immune response has been major point right nowadays a lot of people are studying it and in cancer people are using immunology to solve this problem even if it is m2 response does not mean that it is the most ideal one what we are trying to do is the first step is biocompatibility as you imagine for a scaffold so if it is biocompatible it means the not lot of m1s are there a lot of immune immune cells are coming there and they are trying to get rid of the scaffold is not a good sign so our system is preferable to m2 means that it is pro regenerative we are trying to help the body to heal itself so you, there is a wound healing process like immune response tissue granulation and uh, regeneration process and the maturation so the first part immune response has to align with the tissue granulation so we still have to check i think that would come in single cell sequencing data that how these cells are coming at what time do they have all those necessary cells as we would like we would like to see in the control cystectomy control so the answer is just by doing ihc we know what happened how many cells are there but what is the profile what is the transient profile of those cells coming going or coming back or what time they are coming all those things would be answered in more experiments that we will do ha huh. so the last question uh, piyush is asking he she, he is also a very brilliant uh, btech mtech dual degree he will be finishing his master degree by next year and he is also working with me as an intern student from biotechnology department so his question is if we don't have hands on experience in techniques like ihc and ngs can we learn them in the course of our phd at hopkins or it is really necessary to have it previously so the answer is to for your phd you don't have to uh, have hands on experience on these techniques but when you publish papers right you experience 
what what you contributed in the paper writing part or doing some experiment but not all the experiments yeah you can get training on isc and related experiments in hopkins but i i would definitely hope that uh, you know here in hopkins the bachelor students learn isc or histology or at least make the sections they might not be perfect in that but master students definitely start learning those things so bachelor students they do the first thing in the lab for the research experience how to cut section this is how it starts so to compete and come to the top universities not to come to the top university i don't think even that way to make a amity university the top university not in only in india in ua in throughout the world everyone has to contribute and the contribution Absolutely. comes up how how well qualified you are right why hopkins you can make amity hopkins now it would be a process right it's not overnight but you have at the bachelor level or masters level you should be able to know as much as possible if the facilities are there use it right if the facilities are not there ask your pis that how can we have that we want to do it ourselves why we have to go and learn somewhere else so you are catalyst of change and so suppose dr prahari has some instruments she does not have other instruments so you keep asking her can we have that in our lab there is a lot of financial things and constraint but you know when you show interest as students dr pahari would like to have those because your students are inspiring her asking her like you know come on we can have it here so learn as much as possible whatever you have like when i was in iit sometimes we did not have tiny things nowadays might things might have changed i learned everything in united states like how to synthesize Uh, you know chemistry uh, because i was not a chemist so the potential of you as a learner is huge so do learn as much as possible whatever is there and then come there is no necessity for you to know everything but good to know right and one last one from dakshi how far are we from safely translating tissue engineering based solution into reconstructive urology <laughs> it is an open ended question dakshi it's very hard i don't know the answer because you see when we try to rush like uh, tony atala's work right he was a superstar researcher he is still a super research, a star researcher he has a lot of funding and he's very well known physician and is a good surgeon he's pioneer in tissue engineering but what happens is when you rush through it you just use anything and just try to show you know results it won't work so i would say it would take time we don't know the timeline maybe if you just ask me a time i would say 15 years maybe why 15 years we don't even we are not even able to regenerate tissues in bigger animals properly suppose we take dogs or uh, pigs and we use to make we make a conduit which should be functional it is only partially successful so in clinics it will be mostly failures right so hopefully you know 15 to 20 years we should be more mature we have with us professor nithi chaudhary uh, she is uh, one of the center director of our amity institute of biotechnology she is asking give suggestions for filling gaps on both sides of globe in terms of higher education okay so <laughs> so there are two so education if you ask me since you asked the question to me i would say education does not mean information so science is great what we are doing but the attitude the way knowledge should be applied all those things should be there as well nowadays what i see in the students in united states at least in my lab for whom i taught foreigners coming from china or india they are a little bit more sincere than people here sincerity means what like you know they are on the facebook because we cannot enforce them not to have mobile phone we can set guidelines in india is different so people who have um fire to grow and learn they do well here what we are missing is in united states we have all the facilities but the attitude is not there you know and if you ask about phd students out of 20 phd seats most of them would be for of native this country the reason is they are getting smarter uh, everything at the end becomes money matter 
so they know this and then they don't want to invest that much of life into phd and degrees and not getting paid that much so it's a different story it's, it's a capitalistic country it's all about money in that way back in india what we are so here um, people are very confident okay they they think that they are the best in everything they know we are the developed country everybody comes here so from childhood they are very very confident in one way they become so confident uh, they they lose the humility the attitude becomes very stiff so back in india uh, what i observe in most of the people they lack that kind of confidence i don't know why it's not that they don't know much is is they know better than a lot of people here but they think that somehow they are inferior the inferiority complex that should be you know that should be removed from the head you always think you are the best you think whatever you had you did the best you would and contribute back to the country you cannot just just use the country as a medium to become what you want you have to give back if you don't give back anything how the other people would get benefited right so educational gap i would say the basic concept of education in us is about how a student should be is not there anymore but back in india it's about confidence leadership we always try to see someone that doing and we want to follow become a leader yourself why you have to come to hopkins that's why i was saying i'm not saying you don't come to hopkins why i'm not saying that you cannot come to mit what i'm saying you have to make your university the top class university better than other places we don't even talk about india think about world okay it is not possible overnight but unless you think that it is not possible you cannot become a leader by thinking that i want to go to hopkins or amit wants to become hopkins or amit wants to become an i no, mit a lot of people in iit or iits even at the director level they would think that oh we want to make our institute like mit that is the step you have to cut through cut through you don't want to be someone you be what you want to be you don't have to compare you just be very good iit so good that it is better than mit right now i am talking about 100 years 50 years time scale but that mentality has to come if it is not coming we would always be like that we always be following us hopkins and mit look at the you know israel ranjan patra probably knows wiseman institute right they are like you know top institute they are like almost mit did they always keep looking for that we want to become high mit they just a tiny country they just work hard and they choose the right problem finding the right problem is important you cannot keep working on the rubber it was major development happened in world war 2 we cannot keep working on that we have to pick up the most exciting problems which is happening right now in the world if you do that because you are talented dr pahari a lot of faculties in amiti they are so talented if they just choose the right problems and work on that there is no one who is going to stop you to become the world leader in the in education just choose the right problem the problem that is needed right now not problems coming from you know 20 years back that is one of the things that i have been seeing lot of papers are coming good papers things are going in right direction we just become faster become more taking the leadership that i want to do this why not aging right now why not synthetic biology right now why cannot we do immunology oncology all those things just jump into it these are you know we use our brain they use our they use their brain they they can do it we can do it right okay. i hope that answers the question is long but it's a long yeah. story i want to do <laughs> yes <clears throat> okay so uh, i would like to express my thanks to each one of you who participated in this webinar and uh, we are hopeful that you enjoyed the scientific part and you can use this learning for your research work related to such designing of scaffolds uh, especially i would like to give special thanks to dr singh for his talk and congratulate him for his outstanding work and which he has done inspiring the nature taking the inspiration from nature
So thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And um, you'd like to have several interactive webinars with you in the long run. And we would like to invite you once you are here in India to come and visit us. Right. Thank you, Dr. Pahari, and thank you, Ankita. Thank yeah. you, Nidhi, and Dr. Patra for and students who asked the question. I think if I missed any questions, you can always mail me. Yeah. Um, my email is I'm just typing here so that everybody can see. Uh, in in the chat box, you can see my email. Yeah. And you can email me for whatever questions you have. And I wish you best, become the best, be the best, and always deliver the best and make other people best. Okay, that is important. You just don't live your life for yourself. You have to contribute back. With that, I would say bye and hope to see you all soon. Yeah, thank you so much. We hope uh, a safe stay for you in this pandemic situation. And with this, we end the session. Thank you so much. Sure.